industrial organization at Harvard, and I emphasize Harvard more in the sense of metonymy as a state of mind rather than a particular place because there's a whole tradition in industrial organization going back four or five decades to the work of Joe Bain talking about market failures and appropriate policy interventions. A lot of people from that school, including myself, have watched, I must confess, with some dismay as a very simplified notion of markets swept around the world and got conflated with globalization. Several different reasons for this. One is, of course, that since the 70s, early 1980s, we've seen not just major increases in many measures of cross-border integration, but we've also seen a deregulatory movement around the world. It's more plausible to think that the two go hand in hand than if we hadn't had those several decades where they moved together. Second, the triumph of perfect markets or markets effectively close to working perfectly was so close that even Larry Summers you know, declared a couple of years ago, we're all Friedmanites now. So Larry from the Harvard Econ Department, Keynesian antecedents, indication of how far the perspective had actually shifted. And so certainly if one was interested in encouraging more cross-border integrations, you probably didn't want to take on Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, Larry Summers, and everybody else. It was sort of probably better to jump onto markets are great bandwagon and have no problems and lay on top of that the idea that the cross-border integration of markets is something that's very important to pursue. Well, for me, the crisis and the period since the crisis has been a reminder of the incidence and importance of market failures. And personally, the question that I've been wrestling with a lot in my recent work is, okay, given that we have a renewed appreciation of, why mar of market failures, how much they matter, and how widespread they are, does that change how sh we should be thinking about the cross-border integration of markets, which is the key function of the ITC of the, uh, many of the other organizations represented in the room. And again, I think it's important in this sense to get beyond the conflation of cross-border integration of markets with the notion that markets are perfect. And I've had lots of discussions of this in particular with Danny Roderick, who has his famous policy trilemma, which I've simplified down to a policy dilemma. But the basic idea is, look, if markets are perfectly integrated, there's no room left for national regulatory discretion. Part of the reason I started off yesterday by pointing out that markets are not perfectly integrated was to point out that that leaves some policy space for countries to actually pursue. Give, me, give a specific example. Think of food, issue that's come up several times. We know about riots that have happened recently. Food is a clear case where simply relying on the price mechanism has proven politically and I would say ethically problematic. Pure, pure reliance on the price mechanism without any kinds of supports, cushions, etc. On the other hand, does that mean that we should be closing down world food trade? Well, there's a lot of work by the ITC suggesting that what little attempt possibility there is of leveling some of these fluctuations is associated with open markets with more than say 5% of world cereal production being traded on open markets. So I'd like to leave you with the thought that we've gone through some significant learning about market failures in recent years. Uh, that learning about market failures has reminded us of many of the challenges that we face, but Given that levels of cross-border integration are limited, there is still not just a need for, but scope for actions to be taken to correct those market failures at the same time that we pursue this path towards greater openness. And with that, let me turn it over to Patricia after first, of course, thanking all the panelists for the excellent job that they did. Thank you very much, Dr.
professor. I keep calling you doctor. You know, you must have been a doctor before you were a professor. So um, you still are doctors. So I don't think I'm too wrong. Uh, professor Gamawat. Um, it has been a wonderful two days and a bit. And certainly I would like to think that we are all leaving here in a positive mood and that indeed we feel that we can actually uh, take advantage of what we have listened to over the last couple of days. I think it also helps that um, we have taken on the Chinese interpretation of crisis, which means that there is opportunity as well as uh, uh, an opportunity comes out of crisis. And I think that we also understand that uh, thinking ahead, we will be able to respond to some of these new market opportunities that we have learned about, because there is always a solution to a problem. Now, I want to emphasize a couple of, of areas that we focused on in the last couple of days. Clearly, according to Professor Gamowat and, and, the, and the work that he presented, we're not as globalized yet as people think. So that 15 to 20 percent of globalization, which currently uh, we're at, that you know, clearly the pie is not, not closed pie. We can grow this pie. And, and therefore, therefore there is opportunity for more of us. The, the question, question of large economies and is there a need for rebalancing growth of domestic demand and also boosting exports at the same time, I think we came down on the argument that we have to do both. Uh, the fact that companies should focus on value rather than volume in trade, I think this is a consensus that has been built over the last two days. And, uh, prof and <laughs> Professor, I'm looking at you now, I'm really tired. <laughs> Ambassador Bhatia, you, uh, you certainly gave us um, the, the uh, final word on that. The fact that we should be thinking long term rather than short term, and I think that there is a consensus that we need to find the incentives to make that happen. We have to find ways to, to make that happen. The regulatory framework should support this, and therefore, whether we look at fiscal measures and targeted support to deal with the market failure. This is what we'll need to do, and of course, we've got to enhance some kind of innovation to be able to make sure that this happens. The importance of regional integration, and I think that this is even more important in Africa where uh, regional integration is a must and imperative for Africa to move forward. Clearly, uh, for small areas like the Pacific and the Caribbean, I think this is also critical and important. And uh, to a lesser extent, although we see it happening in Latin America very much, it's a, it, it's a movement in Latin America, um, clearly, this is also important. The utilization uh, of South-South trade as a mechanism to actually expand markets, this was definitely identified as a growth area where should, we should all be looking at this. At the same time, trade in services is a growing area, and I think that uh, both Laos and Mexico spoke to the importance of tourism as, as one of those low barrier entry, low entry uh, kinds of industries that least developed countries can look at as a means to grow jobs. The issue of urbanization brought in as a, as a, as a critical tool for poverty re reduction, but also linked to export strategy so that we don't have the problems that we've seen in many developing countries with urbanization creating uh, a negative impact on our societies. However, these opportunities all need to be cast in a context, I believe, of low carbon growth. Uh, we have to take, put into consideration our planet if we are going to not hit up on many of these constraints that, uh, that Alex pointed to. Clearly, 